Good morning. Just a good reminder of where our strength comes from. Amen? Amen. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. And just want to, before I begin, say thank you for being with us, especially if you're here for the first time or the first time in a long time. We're just so glad that you are here. Before we dive into the word this morning, I want to bring your attention to one detail that happened during the summer. And I'm realizing that when we announce something that's happened in the summer, sometimes some of you are on vacation or you missed the, the communication or whatnot. And so I want to communicate to you once again that at the end of August, early September, we were received into the Rosedale Network of Churches. Um, us as pastors, our credentials were approved and we are now credentialed with the Rosedale Network of Churches as pastors. So we are in. So if you did not know that, we are in. I um, also want to bring a little bit of clarity to another portion of the whole thing, and that has to do with something called com, uh, conservative Amish Mennonite Mutual Aid, okay? So I want to be very clear, Rosedale Network of Churches and CAM, as I call it, are two separate entities. Rosedale is not CAM, and CAM is not Rosedale. Being a part of a conservative Mennonite network of churches makes the availability of CAM, we thought, there. The issue right now is we reached out to CAM to come and do a presentation for you in regards to homeowners insurance, and they have communicated to us that at this present time, they are not writing new policies for Sarasota because of the overwhelmedness of the policies. Now, we're going to revisit that at the first of the year, but that is where they are at right now. So I just wanted to be clear with you all on that. They are two separate things. Rosedale is, the insurance doesn't come through Rosedale. It's a benefit of being a part of that network, but there are Amish networks, there are Amish conferences, there are Mennonite networks, there are Mennonite conferences that all have um, benefits. So we're hoping and praying that that benefit will be extended to us in the future. They're hoping and praying that that may work out. But right now at the present time, and I'm going to be honest with you with what just happened in our city um, and the amount of CAM policies that are in an area just west of us, um, it might be a little bit. So, um, and trust me, for those of you that say, man, I really wish I would be a part of that, there's probably nobody in the room right now that would benefit greater than being in a CAM policy versus the policy that I do have because CAM would have covered everything in a very, very strong way. So my joke is I will be knocking on their door when I'm in Middlebury, Indiana the next time saying, take me, all right? I will fight for us, trust me. It is there, especially with what we're going through right now. So if any, there was any misinformation or miscommunication on that, you can even look it up. CAM has its own website. I believe it's conservative. If you Google conservative Amish Mennonite mutual aid, or maybe it's just conservative Mennonite, it's CAM for short. So um, you can look it up, and, and we have reached out. We are in communication with them. I know the rep from uh, one of the area reps very well. He's kind of going to champion for us as well. So we'll keep you updated as that goes on. Hopefully we may have good news at our congregational meeting in December in regards to that, but trust me, I'm fighting. Anyway, all right, so uh, in, in regards to the word, if you would open your Bibles to Matthew 16. Is that right? Something doesn't seem right about that. Um, let me look that up in my own Bible. Go ahead to Matthew 16 with me. Um, for some reason in my mind, I was preaching out of John. Did I preach out of John 16 last week? We're good. Matthew 16. I did study, I promise. I did study, I did pray. Matthew 16, we're going to be starting with verse 21. Jesus said in this conversation to the apostles, he said, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of, religious, of the religious law. He told them he would be killed, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and realized that Peter, just a few moments prior to this, got affirmed by Jesus. He, Peter, Jesus had just asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter says, well, you're the son of God. And, and, and Jesus affirms that and affirms Peter for saying it. So Peter's probably uh, riding on cloud nine. His ego is probably a little bit high at this point, he's just been affirmed by Jesus, the Son of God, just declared in the Son of God. And so Peter decided, 
I'm going to take Jesus aside and let him know, which is a good, I could do a whole sermon on this moment right here of Peter taking Jesus aside and trying to tell Jesus how it's going to go. Anybody relate to that? So Peter takes him aside and he begins to reprimand him. I don't know if you've ever reprimanded Jesus or not, but Peter decided, heaven forbid this, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. It's such an interesting statement and it's so direct and it's so forceful in its nature and it's in its original writing. It's such, it, like, it's a demand almost from what I understand. Peter's like, nope, Jesus, not going to happen, not on my watch, you're not dying, you're not going to get raised again, so let's stop talking about it. I think that conversation can relate some, at least in my own walk. Jesus turns to Peter and says, and I don't know uh, if you've ever been corrected by the Lord, I don't know if you've ever been disciplined by the Lord, but Peter got it right smack between the eyes in a way that I hope and pray I never put the Lord in a position where he has to reprimand or correct me in this manner. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. And I think, I don't believe Jesus was talking to Peter directly. I think Peter was, I think Jesus was talking to the spirit Remember the spiritual realm is all there. We've talked a little bit about that in the past couple of months. But I don't know that he's directly talking to Peter here, but yet he is because he knows that Peter, in a sense, is being influenced by Satan who has affected and infected the entire world. We talked about that last week. Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me because you are seeing things merely from a human point of view. You're seeing things from your flesh. You're seeing things from your mental capacity. You're seeing things as, as you're seeing things ground level right now. And Jesus is kind of like, not from God's. And, and in, a mo in, in an essence, Jesus is saying, listen, Peter, I fly up here. This is the realm where my wisdom comes from. You're working in this realm right here. You're working in Satan's territory when it comes to your line of thinking I understand what you're thinking, but I need you to be thinking up here because I'm following the directive of the Lord and I need you to follow the directive of the Lord. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. And I'm, it's interesting at this point in time, I'm feeling like you're telling guys that have already done this, like you've already called them from their fishing boats, you've already called them from their tax collector's booths, you've already called them from normal everyday life into this abnormalcy that you are now showing them. And, but yet he says to them, if any of you wants to be my follower, wants to be my disciple, wants to be called a Christian, you must give up your own way, you must take up your cross, and you must follow me. If you try to hang on to your own life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And the title of this morning's message comes... I'm kind of wrapping up this three-week series titled When Normal Isn't Normal Anymore, and the title for part three is Profit and Loss. Profit and Loss, and it comes from the next verses. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing right here, right now, will not die before the son of, he, they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And the disciples got to see that. The disciples got to see Jesus die, be raised again, and become the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and take his kingdom back from the enemy. Amen? Amen. They got to see that. Last week we talked a little bit about um, the fact that we live in God's creation, we don't live in our own creation. Everything that we've ever created comes from the wisdom that God has given us to create it. Everything we've ever invented has come from the wisdom that God has given us to invent that. Airplanes, cars, any, any type of engineering that you see out there comes from the wisdom of God. It is his creation. It is his creation. But we also know that his creation is subjected to trouble and hardship. We know that from the fall of man, that the Lord cursed the ground that we worked, walked on, and he said, from dust you came, and from dust you will return. 
So we know that all of creation, we read that verse last week, all of creation is moaning and groaning and aching for the return of the Lord. Anybody moaning and groaning in the room for the return of the Lord? Some of us are just moaning and groaning because we're getting old, and that's what we do. Me, me too. Me too. So we know that his creation is subjected to this trouble and hardship, but we also know that his creation is subjected to this trouble and hardship with hope. And it's not just any hope. Like, I hope my football team is going to win today. I have a hope. I hope that lunch is going to be good. I have a hope for this coming week. But this is a different hope. This is a different hope that we are subjected to. We are, we are subjected to the hope, to the hope of knowing and believing and in the innermost sense of our being, of who we are, down to the deepest core of who you are. We know, we know that our troubles and our hardships, our trials and our tribulations, we know that they will come to an end no matter how bad things might get here on earth. So last week, it's interesting talking to quite a few of you this week how I piqued your interest, probably more so than I ever have with a coming sermon. I guess last week when I said, we're going to talk about the American dream versus walking in the kingdom of God. I'm going to call it God's dream for you. So we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between the American dream and God's dream for you. And does the American dream hinder God's dream? And the answer to that is yes, it does. But the answer to that is no, it doesn't have to. So yes and no. Yes, the American dream can hinder what God wants to do through you and what he wants to do through you, especially in the kingdom of God. But it doesn't have to because you can still be born and raised in this country. You can still live in this country all of your life in, the, in Sarasota, Florida with the beaches to the west and the palmetto bushes to the east. And the oak hammocks out there, if you don't go out east and see the oak hammocks, they're beautiful. Go out to Gator Camp sometime. It's a beautiful, beautiful place out east. We live in a beautiful part of the country. In a sense, some would say we live in paradise. So how do you live in paradise and follow what Jesus just said to his disciples? How do we live in paradise and not follow our own way? How do we live in paradise and take up our cross daily, and how do we live in paradise and try not to hang on to our own lives? Because we talk about, you've heard me talk a lot about dependency upon the Lord. It's real easy to be a Christian in this country and not have to depend on the Lord. Because we have enough. We have enough to fix our problems. We have the doctors to fix our problems. We have medicine to heal our wounds and to heal our infirmities. So how do we not allow Christianity to just be a belief and a practice? How do we actually follow God, take up our cross? Because you do know that that statement to the disciples, take up your cross, you do know that Jesus wasn't the only person hung on a cross in the Roman Empire, correct? You know that, right? So that when Jesus said hey, I'm going to need you to take up that cross. The Roman practice was to hang people on crosses just outside of the city limit on the major thoroughfare of whatever town or village that they did it in. So I-75 at exit 210, if we lived in the Roman Empire and you, and you were guilty of something against the Roman Empire and they needed to punish you, they would hang you at exit 210 on a cross. In our day and age, they put you in an electric chair out at exit 210. And Jesus is saying to these gentlemen, you're going to do that. One of them got hung upside down on a cross because when they went to hang him, he said, I don't feel like I can be hung in the same way that Jesus was, so hang me upside down. It's an interesting thought. And it all starts right here. The calling of the disciples walk with him came when he said come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men come follow me and I'll, I'll deliver you from that taxation thing that the Romans have you doing but here he gives them vision and direction for what he needs them to do I need you to follow me I need you to take up your cross and I need, I need you to give up your own way so give up your own way take up your cross and follow me 
That's what I need you to do. That's the calling. So is the American dream, which I Googled this, or AI'd it, which AI kind of is beginning to scare me just a bit. So I did that this week, and this is what Google tells me the American dream is. The American dream is the belief that anyone can attain their own version of success in a society where upward mobility is possible for everyone. I don't think there's innately anything wrong with that. It's opportunity. Okay, remember that, write that word down. Even if you're not taking notes, write the word opportunity down. We live in a country where we strive for every single person in this room to have opportunity. Now, I don't know that that's necessarily true because maybe the same opportunities for us as, let's call us middle class citizens, may not be the same opportunity for every single person in this city. The school you're sitting in right now is a, is a good illustration of that. Not every family in this city has the opportunity to send their child to a private Christian and give them a private Christian education like some of you are able to do for your children. But the opportunity is there. So the American dream would say work harder. The American dream would say be more committed to it and maybe you'll make enough to send your children to private Christian education or own your own home or own your own cars, or own your own business, for that matter. The opportunity is there. I don't think there's innately anything wrong with that. If you look back to the reason the forefathers began to fight against the British, it was in large part because of the fact that we wanted the freedom to, to we wanted the freedom from obviously taxation and the economy and all that, but we also wanted freedom to express our religious beliefs in a way that the church was, tell the church was telling them to express their beliefs in a certain way and taxing them, and they wanted to be free from that. They wanted the opportunity to worship God freely without all of the hindrances and without all the guidelines that the Catholic Church, in a sense, or the Church of England at that time, was placing upon them. The American dream isn't a terrible thing, I don't believe. Examples of the American dream include owning your own house, starting a family, having a stable job, or owning your own business, for that matter. But I also know that there's a creator of the universe that created everything, and he created you, and he has a dream, and he has a desire for you. I'm going to share this morning some inner things that are happening inside of me, and I, I ask for a little bit of grace as I share this. I'm going to be vulnerable in front of you for a moment because of the season in life that we were in. I had a question asked of me Friday that was a really, really good question that has really made me think through the question since it's been asked on Friday morning. So Friday morning, I'm out at the house, and um, there's some ugly bushes that needed to go long before the storm went, and so I decided since the storm killed about half of them from the bottom down, where I started beginning to rip them out. So I'm out there kind of working and kind of just normal Friday for me would have been at the house. I would have been doing yard work. I would have been um, spending the morning working on the house and might have jumped in the pool because I was sweaty and hot and all that stuff. And so it was, it was weird. I was there, but I had to drive there. I had to work, and then I had to get in the truck and go home and take a shower somewhere else. Leaving our house is the struggle right now. For some of you who've asked us this morning, it's not the, it's not the condition of the house, ironically. It's, it's having to leave it. It's having to drive out of our neighborhood and leave our home behind. So as I'm working Friday, a few guys few neighbors just stop by and whatnot and I end up with a couple of neighbors um, and we're talking about different things and we're sharing different stories. We're comparing notes on where we're at. Who has The question right now in our neighborhood is, do you got drywall yet? Do you got drywall yet? Do you got drywall yet? I told somebody the other day, I got drywall and paint. No, I didn't. Um, if you say that, everybody looks at you like they want to punch you. What do you mean you got paint already? That's just, that's just the world we live in right now, and it's the conversations we're having. And so we're talking about each, each of us are kind of giving an update on each of our houses, and uh, a friend of ours that go to Abundant Life that live around the corner from us, he pulls up, 
and then one of the other contractors who's been working in the neighborhood, he's a Christian, and he pulls up, and we're just kind of sharing, and the other guys move on. Um, I, I found sometimes when you're, when you're a pastor and you're talking to guys and you bring up Christ, um, they back up from you a little bit, but then if your friends show up and, and you really begin to talk about Christ, they take off, like, pew, I'm gone. So that kind of happened. Um, and so, interesting enough, the friend from Abundant said, you know, Andy, I have to admit something to you. And I said, what's that? He goes, you know, you used, when you would preach at Abundant, man, I loved your passion. And he said, but sometimes your passion would, would overwhelm you and you would cry. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, so I, I would pray to the Lord, like, give me the same passion Andy has. Just don't make me cry. And he goes, well, I have to admit, do you ever just sit in your house? He goes, I, from time to time lately, I've just grabbed a bucket and I've sat in my house and I've cried. And we talked about the grieving that's inside of us. And, and as we talked about the different feelings and the different emotions that come and go through all this, he goes, you know, Andy, should we have this emotion towards our stuff? Like, is it right to be feeling? Like, is it right to be grieving? Like, there's a grieving inside of us. It's not necessarily the same type of grieving that has happened if you've lost somebody. Like, my brother and dad passed away two years ago, and so there was a grieving that we went through for that. This is a little bit different, but yet it's still a bit of a grieving. And he asked this question, like, should we be holding on to stuff so tightly that when it's gone like this, we grieve and it tightens and whatnot? And I'm like, that's a good question. That is a great question. I don't know if you know this or not. I was reminded, I got a text last Sunday afternoon after preaching um, from somebody in the church that wasn't able to be here, but she texted me a reminder of the fact that the very first sermon I ever preached to you in this room was the Sunday after Irma hit. And I called the sermon Thoughts from the Storm. When she reminded me of the sermon in the text, I looked, at, I looked it back up, and I'm like, sure enough, there it is. And my points that Sunday from that sermon, I have to look it up here. I had it pulled up. Um, give me just a second. Here it is. So the reminder of the, the sermon, this is what she said, Andy, you preached on thoughts through the so storm because it was right after a hurricane had been here. You preached three things that we need to do when we go through storms in our life. You need to be honest. You need to ask help. And you need to question sincerely. Those were my three points. After It was just, I mean, that you guys remember Irma came through and made a mess of the whole city. Um, our, our house came through just fine on that one, which is another question um, about our neighborhood and all that. Be honest, accept help, and question sincerely. Those were the points. And I remember, as I looked at my notes from that sermon that time, I remember telling you all the, the, the conviction that the Lord had placed on my heart during that week was that I wasn't necessarily concerned about safety and health. I knew we were going to be fine. I was concerned about my house being damaged. I was concerned about the roof, because at that point in time, the roof was older. I was concerned about having to replace the pool case. I, my concern was about my stuff. And so here we are. This would have been 20, I looked it up, this would have been 2017. We came to Bayshore in 2018, so Irma hit in the summer, end of summer of 2017. We had been in the house for two years because we had moved in the house, into the house in 2015. And here I am preaching this series because I have lost exactly what I feared would get damaged after Irma. That's a crazy thought. And then the friend asked me the question, should we be grieving this much over our stuff? And I'm going to try to answer that question this morning with Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. That might be wrong on the screen. Does that say 33? Yes, it does. It's wrong in my notes. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So to answer the question, is the American dream stifled? Is, is it possible to walk and serve the Lord in the manner in which he's called us to with the American dream over us? I think the passages that we've looked at, go back to Matthew 16, 24 for me, Jace. 
It said, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. So basically what Jesus is saying here is you need to surrender your life. You'll notice I termed the next one, take up your cross. You need to live out an unwasted life, and we need to follow his will for our lives. That's, that in an, in, a, in an essence, that might simplify it too much. I'm sorry if it simplifies it too much for you, but I told you last week that these sermons are going to be a little bit different. They're going to be a little bit more simplified a little bit more practical. Surrender your life. You do realize that that takes death to do that. The word surrender is more than just, hey, I, you know what, I'm wrong in the argument. I surrender. Uh, you know, you're right, I'm wrong. It, it, it's not that. It's death. That's why the cross came into the conversation. We don't teach death to self near as much as what I, we probably should when it comes to the wa our walk with Christ and how God has called us to walk with him. Surrender your life. Take up your cross means live out an unwasted life. If you go on down, Jace, there's a quote there from John Piper's. John Piper wrote an article called The Unwasted Life. That's where this point comes from. And here's what he says. What is the essence of an unwasted life? It is a life that puts the infinite value of Christ on display for all the world to see. The passion of the unwasted life is to joyfully display the supreme excellence of Christ by the way it lives. Life is given to us so that we can use it to make much of Christ. Possessions are given to us so that by the way we use them, we can show that they are not treasure. But Christ is our treasure. Money is given to us so that we will use it in a way that shows money is not treasure, but Christ is our treasure. So Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I want to I first look at the phrase, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now Jesus is talking in Matthew 6 about worry. He's kind of confronting the whole worry issue. Like, don't worry about those things. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Roger and I joke about this verse in a sense, but it's actually serious. If you live this way, all will go well. Doesn't mean you, will, doesn't mean you won't have trouble. Doesn't mean you won't go through hardship. But if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then you know what's going to happen? He's going to add exactly what he desires to your life. Now, I want to, we talked about the word opportunity, correct? Right? Remember the word opportunity? Talked about that word. I want you also to write the word down, the word capacity down. So here's the interesting thing about life. It's not fair. Life isn't fair. I wouldn't let my boys say that isn't fair in our house. Because you know what? Sometimes I would bless Austin more so than we would bless Caleb. And you know what? Sometimes we would bless Caleb more so than we would Austin. Just depending on what was going on in their lives at that moment. Austin turned 16 prior to Caleb turning 16. Austin got a car fairly quickly after turning 16. Only because we were tired of shuttling him around and we needed him to help shuttle Caleb around. So necessity came, we got him a car quicker. Caleb comes around, we're like, ah, we'll get you a car when we feel like it. <laughs> it's not fair, right? That's right, it's not fair, because life isn't fair. We don't all get a trophy. All these things should be added unto you according to what he desires of you and for you in that moment. That's what I believe that the Lord is saying here. And for some of you, the Lord has given you a capacity to handle much. He's given you opportunities to handle much. But you know what comes with that? Responsibility. Because with the much that he's given you comes opportunity to use that much to glorify him in, to, in some extreme ways. So some of you in here, the Lord has added unto you, he has added unto you a lot so that you can bless extravagantly. And that's a crazy word. I get it. So let me put it bluntly. If you're rich in this room by our standards, then God has given you opportunity and he's placed responsibility on you to bless extravagantly. To bless the kingdom, to build the kingdom in, in certain ways more so than others. 
Is that fair? No, it's not fair. But God has gifted them and blessed them with a capacity that's bigger than mine. You know why I'm not rich beyond measure? Because I don't know how to handle money well. And the Lord knows that. You know, we ask or we say the question all the time, can we trust God? Like, can you trust God? Do you trust God? So here's my question. Can God trust you? It's a little bit more difficult to answer, isn't it? Seek ye first. So God's desire for every single person in this room is that you seek him first. And as you do that, he's going to add to your life according to the calling, the capacity, and the managerial skills he's given you to manage that. For some of you, he's given you, he's blessed you with the gift of giving. And so because he's blessed you with the gift of giving, he, wants to, he needs you to have more than others. For others of you, for others of us, when it comes to money, because honestly, when we read this verse in our mindset, I think that's where the American dream gets a little bit, gets a little bit scary and can, and, and can clog our filters up just a bit. Because in our society, success is measured by what? Stuff, right? The houses you own, the cars you drive, the neighborhoods you live in, all of that. And for some reason, the Lord decided to take 60% of that from Danielle and I. And what the Lord is telling me in this season is, I will reveal to you, I will rebuild back for you, as long as you seek me first in this season. So, is it right for me to be grieving the loss of 60% of our stuff, 60% of our house? Is it wrong for me to be grieving the fact that I can't go home? You all, like, is it wrong for me to be just a tad bit, just a tad bit bitter because you all get to go to your homes after this is over? You all get to go spend your afternoons at your houses, in your homes, most of you? Is it wrong for me to be just a little bit bitter about that? Because I am. Because life isn't normal for me. And for a good percentage of you, it's still normal right now. And it, is it wrong for me to grieve that feeling just a bit? And that's what the Lord is working out in me right now. And it's a tough, tough lesson. It's a tough pill that we're having to chew. You know, the Bible talks a lot about stuff and riches. And we know the camel and the eye of the needle. You know, in Luke 12, I think Jesus said it perfectly, to whom much is given, much is required. And every single person in this room on a global standard, on a global standard, on a global scale has been given much. Has been given much. As we led missions teams into Brazil and Panama and Costa Rica and Nicaragua, we ended up in some indigenous areas of those countries. Back back jungle areas of those countries. For Panama, we had to take long boats down these canals. It took three hours riding in these long boats to get to this indigenous village. In Brazil, we end up on a village that's built on top of a dump. If you remember when Rothenbach was the city dump or the county dump, imagine a village of cardboard boxes built and children living in those boxes with their parents. So by global standards, we are rich. And should we feel guilty about that? Absolutely not. We should feel responsible to use what God has given us. And when he calls, and here's the thing, here's what I believe, here's what I believe, those of you especially with more, let's call it capacity, you're more entrepreneurial than most, and your business is successful, and you've just been very successful in life. Here's, here's what I would say to you. I would say, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and when he calls you, when he says, listen, it's my will for you to use some of that to build the kingdom, then do it. And for those of us that capacity is a little lower, maybe we're a little more middle of the road, I would say, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and when he calls you, when he calls you to use some of it to build the kingdom of God, you do it. And for those of you that you're sitting here, you're like, okay, so I'm... I probably am the lower tier of capacity and lower tier of things being added to me. 
I would say, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And when he calls you to use some of it to build the kingdom of God, you do it. Because that's living out his dream. That's following his way. And his way we know is higher than our ways. Because if we seek him first and his righteousness and all these things, the stuff that he desires for you to have, he will give to you. But he's giving it to you for his glory. Remember the phrase, it's all from him and it's all for him. Now the incredible things is we get to use we get to use a lot of it to live and produce and build. And we get creature comforts in this country that other countries don't get. As Americans, we get to stand and worship God freely. There's a large portion of Christians this morning that don't have that freedom. I don't feel guilty about that. I feel responsible for it. So I'm going to use that freedom to love the Lord. I'm going to use that. I'm not going to neglect, neglect that freedom by standing in this room and not worshiping God. Because, I, because he's added this to my life. He's added all of you. See, as, the Lord, as Danielle and I have done our best to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness in our lives, you know what he's added to us? You know what the largest capacity of riches that we have right now is you guys. You guys. You guys. And our other brothers and sisters that are loving us and caring for us outside of this room and outside of the Bayshore body. What is the essence of an unwasted life? The essence of it, to live out an unwasted life, is to put the infinite value of Christ on display for the world to see. That's it. The essence of living life unwasted is to put the infinite value of Christ on display for the whole world to see. So as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the things that we are needed to, the things that are needed to do that are added unto us. So here's the thing. I don't think it's wrong to have stuff. Like there's the theology that we should be poor. There's the theology that we should be rich. There's, there's all kinds of weird theologies when it comes to money and, and stuff, right? My theology is that whatever the Lord has granted you, whatever the Lord has blessed you, use it for him. And so what I said back to my friend is, you know, I said as I think about that, Danielle and I have always used our home as a center of ministry. For the past 25 years, our home has been a very intricate part of ministry for us. We've done youth ministry in it. We've done premarital counseling in it. We've done marital counseling in it. We've done personal counseling in it. We've had people over. We've had prayer times in it. We've had worship times in it. And we've owned three different houses. And all three have become an intricate part of our ministry. And this home, and that's not going to change. As our home is rebuilt, it will be the same thing again. Some of you have experienced that in our home. You've experienced premarital or marital or some type of counseling. You've experienced leadership team meetings. You've experienced prayer times. You've experienced all kinds of different meetups in our home, especially right now because we don't have the building. So whatever the Lord has added unto you, he's added unto you to display the infinite value of Christ and to be used for him. So... I had to check my spirit because I could easily say to you, well, I am grieving because I've lost my home and I don't have that center of ministry anymore. And, and there's a part of me that that's probably right, but I can't stand in front of you and, and honestly say I'm not grieving because of the stuff that I've lost. There is a bit of grieving and I think that's where the American dream kind of in, inches its way into our heart and our emotions and I think that's part of it for Danielle and I and the boys I think part of that for us is the lesson of not holding on to things so tight in, mini in our personal lives and in ministry so living out God's dreams, surrender your life live out an unwasted life one of my biggest fears is that I don't do the wrong things one of my biggest fears is that I do things that just don't matter I want to be involved in things that matter to the kingdom of God. 
And the incredible thing about all that church is he's called me to do it in a very beautiful place. And I am so thankful. I tell people all the time, I don't, God would have to burn a bush to get me to leave Sarasota. And that's not just simply because it's a beautiful place. It's just I love the people. I love you. I love the people of Sarasota. And I want to see the Lord move in this region. So worship team, if you would come on back up.